Hello, welcome back to the Rethink Podcast. This is your host, Cameron. Hope you're having a great day today. We are in treat for a great conversation. We're going to have some conversations around political power and how you can utilize your platform and your community for the good of your community. So the Black community has been one of the most underrepresented members of the American political scene for centuries now. There have been multiple attempts to rectify this issue, but now we need real solutions to solving the problems of inequity within the Black community. These organizers can help us to frame how we can utilize Black financial power, voting power, and resources to further build the Black community in the United States. Equity and justice are important parts of the beloved community, and there has been a lack of justice for the Black community. This episode aligns the King Center vision by giving us an opportunity to speak directly to the issue and offer real, tangible solutions to empowering the listeners to make the change they want to see. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, give us the ballot and we will place judges on the benches of the South who will do justly, love mercy, and we will place at the head of the Southern states governors who will, who have not felt not only the tang of the human, but the glow of the divine. In this juncture of our nation's history, there is an urgent need for dedicated and courageous leadership. If we are to solve the problems ahead, and make racial justice a reality. This leadership must be fourfold. So today, joining us is going to be the one, the only, the great Miss Brittany Packnick Cunningham. Brittany Packnick Cunningham is an activist, educator, writer, leading at the intersection of culture, justice, and policy. Brittany serves as a vice president of social impact at BET and is an NBC news political analyst and host of Undistracted, an intersectional news and justice podcast. Brittany is also the founder and principal of Love and Power Works, a full service social impact and equity agency. Brittany is the former co-host of iHeartRadio's best political podcast of 2019, Pod Save the People. And her TED Talk on confidence has been translated into 22 languages and garnered over 7 million views worldwide making it one of the top 10 most popular TED Talks of 2019. Brittany's debut book, We Are Like Those Who Dream, Black Women Speak, is forthcoming. Brittany is a former elementary teacher, education executive, and policy advisor, and nonprofit leader. In the past, Brittany held top roles at Teach for America, was a congressional legislative aide, and a three-time fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics, leveraging her broad skill set on wide ranging justice issues from public education to racial justice. Brittany was a member of the President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force and the Ferguson Commission, helping lead the country and her community through change during times of tumult. Brittany graced the covers of British Vogue and Essence Magazine, been listed as one of Time's 12 new faces of black leadership and has been honored by BET, Beyonce.com, Political Magazine, Marie Claire, the Trayvon Martin Foundation, the National Urban League, Higher Heights, and more. She mentors frequently, served on the Gucci Changemakers Council, Sephora Equity Council, and Children's Defense Fund Action Council. Brittany lives with her husband, Reginald, an artist and photographer, and their son, the light of their lives in the Washington, D.C. area. Please welcome Ms. Brittany Packnick Cunningham. Hey, 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 how you doing, Cameron? I'm doing well. First off, thank you so much for being here today. I have been a true fan of your work for a number of years now. Um, you know, obviously, I'm a millennial, and so I've been listening to you and heard about you for years. <laughs> and I think all the way from Ferguson to where you are now, I think yeah. that what you have done and accomplished in your life is great. And us at the King Center, on behalf of Dr. Bernice King, we are so thankful for your work, and we're so thankful that you made time for us today. I'm so honored uh, by that introduction. I'm honored to be here. You know, the work that you all have done at the King Center has been so critical, not only obviously to keeping the memory of Dr. King and Coretta Scott King alive, um, but of making sure that you all help light the pathway for the future, right? That we really take the beloved community, not just as a beautiful piece of writing, but as a charge, as a command, as um, an aspiration 
um, and and see all of us. I see for us to all see ourselves as as building that together, right? So I'm always glad to be with my King Center family, um, and I'm glad to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, obviously, uh, you know, Brittany, this is a very trying time globally. Mm-hmm. So we have both a a national perspective today, but also an international perspective with everything that's happening around the world. And uh, obviously with Israel and Palestine and Gaza, mm-hmm. there's just so many things that are happening. So obviously our we are of the mindset and our hearts and our prayers are connected to those people who are undergoing suffering. And, and so after having the conversation today, as the audience is engaging with us, you know, we want to also remind that we are a part of a global community and we that's are right. doing the work to invest in the global community as well. And you know, Brittany, over the last 11 years, really since 2012, there have been many tragic moments in Black American life that have led to historic levels of protest and civic engagement. Whether it was the murder and death of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Alton Sterling, Terrence Crutcher, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, or George Floyd, the impact of a collapsing economy and how COVID-19 directly impacted the entire world There have been so many things that have impacted the way millennials and Gen Z are experiencing the American life. That's right. Do you feel that for millennials and Gen Zs that these moments have shaped us? And if so, what are some of the ways that you do believe that those moments have impacted us? I mean, what a great question and also a critically important introduction you gave to really frame all of these conversations and the consistent work of justice in a global context, right? Because um, we are not here alone. It would be important for us not to have a Western-centric view or an America first view or uh, an egocentric view that says we're the only people on the planet and the only ones we need to worry about, right? Um, And so given all of the things that you named and given um, the... The, the violent tragedies that um, Israeli families and Jewish people across their diaspora, across the world are dealing with in this moment, given the, the violence and horror that has been continuously uh, heaved upon our Palestinian loved ones, um, the ways that they are bracing in this moment. Um, I am also thinking about the Arab Spring in this time, right? I'm also thinking about Occupy Wall Street. I'm also thinking about the number of Uh, Black-led nations that have uh, detached themselves from colonizing governments, right? We see people from the Caribbean to the continent of Africa deciding to extrapolate themselves from the empire known as Great Britain. There have been actions and movements and protests and campaigns all across the world from Brazil to Africa to Brooklyn and so many places in between where folks have stood up very clearly to say um, that justice is not only uh, due us, that it is in fact our birthright, right? And, And we know that Dr. King said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So again, that global context that you've set is so critically important And there's no possible way that one could be a millennial like you and I are, that one can be a Gen Zer, that one can be anybody who's connected to another human being and not have been influenced by this era of uprising, right? I mean, heck, it's been hot strikes. It was hot strike summer in in America, right? You got the auto workers, you got healthcare workers at Kaiser, you got SAG after and the actors and, you know, customers, you got the writer strike. Like there were so many people coming together and saying, we deserve to live thriving lives. And we right. deserve to live lives that are free uh, uh, from the threat of violence of degradation, of dehumanization, of unlivable wages and unbreathable air. Um, And so in that time, it's impossible not to be impacted. I think that, especially when I look at our generation and generations younger than us, one of the ways that we've seen them be impacted and then in turn impact the rest of us is that their timeline baby, it is much quicker than some of ours, right? There are folks who we've seen as revolutionaries and progressives, and then their children are coming along saying, 
y'all aren't moving fast enough on the climate for me, right? Because we are facing existential threats. Y'all didn't replace all of those lead pipes in Flint. Like, let's go ahead and get after that. And I'm going to keep reminding you until you make it happen. Y'all are still trying to drill into indigenous lands and actually harm our water sources. Yeah. And we uh, don't want to just sit at the negotiating table. We're going to put our bodies on the line to not just uh, dramatize the, the risk for everybody who is watching, but actually mount the pressure that protests can create so that you are, so that the powers that be are driven to not only make change, but make change urgently. Um, and that until you do that, we will be right here. Um, and I think that, that that kind of circular influence, if you will, the ways that millennials and Gen Zers and people of all generations really have taken these moments of impact, have taken these global moments of import and said, who am I going to be in this moment? What kind of ancestor will I become? When I look back on what was asked of me in 20 years, will I say I stood by or will I say I stood up? Um, and I think that that has been something that has strengthened global justice movements, irrespective of the issue. Um, and it has certainly strengthened movements inside the Black diaspora. Yeah. You know, Marie, with everything that's happening, you know, I think for many of us, and I know for myself, I've tried to read more into King. Uh, yeah. I think to get some answers for where we are today. And, you know, especially uh, with the King Center's framing and the things that are happening around the world. And, you know, you see this, the recognition of violence and and then subsequently the follow-up uh, for people who feel oppressed with more violence. And, and Dr. King in his work beyond Vietnam in 1967, he said that a true revolution of values will lay hand on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. The business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of people normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. And so even as you know, you're speaking, I'm just thinking about all of the instances of violence that right. we in, in this community have had to overcome, again, millennial and Gen Z, but even around the world, yeah. that there is something that we have to be reconciled to that has to be distinctively different or else it seems that we're going to continue to go down the spiling path of violence yes. and actually solving the issue gets even harder. So I think for you, when you see all of the protest and mm -hmm. all of the crying out that has happened over the last several years, what do you feel like protest does in helping us to point out the problems or injustices we are facing? And then what does it do to help us to get to where we want to go? What role does yeah. protest play in that? So I used to be a teacher. And one of the things that you learn when you're a teacher is to backwards plan. You start first with the goal in mind, and then you work backwards from that and determine in a community of loving and committed people, how together you are going to build toward that goal, right? When you start in the other direction, um, you can often get off. It's easy to get off course, right? It, you can get off course early and often because you do not have that North Star pointing you to freedom, right? The church folks would say, write the vision and make it plain. What Dr. King would say is that uh, justice is not merely the absence uh, of, of violence, but the pr uh, present, uh, sorry, that. let me take that again. Dr. King would say that a uh, true peace is not merely the absence of violence, but the presence of justice. That has to be our North Star. Not this kind of hokey piece where we all hold hands and sing Kumbaya and sing hands across America and say, I love you, you love me, Barney style, right? Um, I just dated myself with that Barney reference, by the way. Uh, right? Like, it's not us saying, you know, because that in effect is us all lives mattering justice. And we know as Black people how we feel when folks tell us all lives matter as a response to Black Lives Matter, um, because often it is meant to diminish injustice. It is meant to diminish the very valid frustrations of marginalized and oppressed people, and in this case, Black people. So if we begin with the end in mind, and we say we all deserve to live in a just world, 
in a peaceful world, not one where we just experience the absence of violence, but where we experience the presence of justice, then we have to be real and absolute about what that means. And that's going to make people uncomfortable. It's going to mean that people are going to have to share power that they've been trying to hoard for a long time. It means that people are going to have to deal with themselves and look in the mirror. It means that people are going to have to engage with their communities globally and locally very differently. So what are some of those absolute truths, right, that we need to be reckoning with ourselves? One of those absolute truths that we need to be reckoning with ourselves is that violence is something that tears us apart literally and morally. Everything and everyone we love is pulled apart at the seams when violence is the order of the day, right? Wow. And that there can be no moving, it's difficult to move forward from a position of violence because it causes so much harm to the human body, the human mind, the human psyche, right? There are all some absolute truths that we need to, 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 to wrestle with here. If that's one of them, another one is that the question that do we believe that all people in this world deserve to live freely on their land without threat of oppression, apartheid, or violence? Because if the answer to that as an absolute shared value in a beloved community is yes, then why do indigenous people keep being the exception? Why do black Americans keep being the exception when we seek reparations? Why are indigenous New Zealanders and Australians told that they can't have their land back? Why are Palestinians exempt from that conversation? Because we've got plenty of people that are saying they're liberal, but they only whisper Palestine, right? They're liberal, but for Palestine, right? If we truly believe and we share as a value that people of faith should be able to practice said faith freely and without threat of violence or discrimination or oppression, as long as they are not using that faith to justify harming others, then why are Jewish people across the diaspora um, still subject to anti-Semitism, right? Why are we allowing people to persecute folks just because they don't practice a religion of the book, right? It'd be just because they're not Judeo-Christian or Muslim, right? Why are we still seeing uh, conflicts all around the world based on who people worship and how they worship, right? If there are some absolute truths that we were all in, uh, created with inalienable rights, then why are people still having to fight for them, right? Why are people still saying to politicians, stop banning the books that talk about that identity and those inalienable, inalienable rights? Stop firing the teachers who are talking about it, right? Stop erasing the history that covers it. And so I, I say all of that to say, if we begin with the end in mind of true peace, which is not just the absence of violence, but the presence of justice. And we plan backwards from that. It is going to bring us face to face with some of those hard questions and require us to fully commit to those shared values, even when it makes us uncomfortable. And when we fully commit to those shared values, we can use the power of protest to demonstrate to other people why these things matter, why these inalienable rights and absolute truths don't just apply to you just because you have the power to enforce it and take it from other people. And we can use the power of protest to mount the pressure such that policy change follows, such that people are able to live freely on their land, such that families are able to remain together at the border, such that people are able to you know, breathe clean air, such that people don't have to sit there and convince people that yes, I am a woman but I, and I am human. Yes, I am trans and I am human. Yes, I am Palestinian and I am human. Yes, I'm indigenous and I am human. There are opportunities for us to practice what the beloved community can look like when we are in protest and community together, fighting for the rights of all of us and not just the rights of some of us who feel like it's our time at the front of the line. Mm. You know, Brittany, as you were talking, you know, when you with your friends and like y'all at the house talking and somebody right. gets really into it and you want to like touch their shoulder, touch they need to pass that energy off. That's what I was feeling <laughs> just now. 
So I think that is an incredible oration. I think even just your ability to communicate across several different layers. How can we hold true to these values that every person has an innate worth, an innate value, but yet some people right. don't have access to basic material needs? That's that right. It's the antithesis of nonviolent and the antithesis of what it means to be human. So again, if, if and I think this is a, another follow up here. So I think one of the harder things, uh, Brittany, for a lot of people is, and even for me, you know, when I was younger, yeah, the relationship between protesting and then policy changes. Because obviously, yeah. when something happens, it's really loud, and you want to say something about it. You want to talk on social media. You want to go into the streets. You want to go into the boardrooms, to the classroom. Yeah. And so when you're, whether it's gun violence, yeah, voting rights, whether it's just even something as simple as basic economy. Yeah. How is it? How do you transition from protesting and talking about the negative effects of an issue or something that you don't have or someone else doesn't have and transition that to we're going to implement policy changes that help <clears throat> to substantiate the cause, but also to bring relief to said community that is suffering? Well, first, I think we square ourselves with. um how the injustice shows up violently and traumatically for people. And I think we're used to talking about violence in a particularly salacious way, right? Um, that it is about what is immediate and visible. And we then, and all of those things are absolutely violence, but so is poverty. So are classrooms that are not affirming. So are people walking around having to mask who they really are so that they are not harmed. Right. Um, and I think that when we understand the totality of how these injustices manifest for people in the micro ways and the macro ways and the ways that leave deep, deep scar tissue, we can begin to coalesce around the world we want to create in the beloved community. And again, planning backwards how we can get there. And so what that brings to mind for me, then, is just like we can often misdefine and underdefine what violence is. We can often misdefine and underdefine, uh, forgive me for making up some words here, what protest is, right? So everybody, if you ask people right now to close their eyes and to visualize protest, they might see somebody standing in the street with the sign. They might see somebody in old black and white footage that, and, and plenty of it is actually color footage because it wasn't that long ago, being attacked by a police dog. You might see people marching together in the street. You might envision somebody on a bullhorn. But all of these coalesce into a singular idea of what protest is. But if we think about protest as telling the truth out loud and in public, then actually we have the ability to take the spirit and the mindset of protest to wherever we are. Because to your point, I need people with the protester's mind in the boardroom. I need people with the protester's mind leading a classroom. I need people with the protester's mind behind a pulpit or leading a synagogue, right? Or, or leading a mosque, right? I need, or, or leading a meditation course, right? Or doing sound bowls and Reiki with people. I need people with the protester's mind being neighbors to people, right? I need people with the protester's mind when they show up to vote. And so if it is telling the truth out loud and in public, not your version of the truth, not the version of the truth you got taught through limited history and propaganda, but the truth as it considers justice for all people, then we all have the power to be protesters right where we are. That doesn't mean when it's time to go into the street, don't show up if you are able, still show up for those. But it means that we should take the spirit of that everywhere. And when we do that, it is much easier to recognize that embedded in it is the opportunity to push the systems, the institutions, the places that we inhabit as we engage in that protest. So we don't always have to think of it as one after the other. We don't always have to think of it as a transition if we think of it as something that is happening in an iterative process altogether. Then in a more practical way, right? Because so, you said, I, I love how you really open this up to say that we really want to give people tools, right? I think that there are some people who looked at what happened in Ferguson and learned that Ferguson was the most used hashtag in the first 10 years of Twitter and said, got it. So we got on there, we go viral, we get everybody to use the hashtag and a movement is born. No, beloved, 
right? Like I would love for it to work that easily. But in actuality, there were relationships built. There were principles that were created and tried and tested and reformulated when we realized that they weren't deep enough. There was street protest. There was interruption of football games. There were people showing up at city council meetings and sign up, signing up for the, uh, you know, to speak publicly. There were folks who would, you know, call their congressperson, call their city councilor, call their mayor. There were people who realized that they had the power of the pocketbook and they were going to protest economically. There are people who realized that ha they had access to those policymakers and those change makers and said, let me get, you know, all these years I've been supporting you. Let me get a private meeting with you. Right. So I can, so I can get you together on this because I've got access to do so. And when I do so, I'm going to bring three other people with me right. that you haven't met, but that you need to hear from. Right. So like in the, in the practicality of it all, what first has to happen again is you have to begin with the end in mind. What is what is your goal and who can make that happen? Is it the mayor's office because the mayor's office appoints the police chief? Is it the city council because they set the police budget? Is it the governor because they actually give the money to the municipalities and supply all of these people with these weapons of war warfare and neighborhoods? Is it the federal government because they control a number of carceral spaces and jails and prisons? Is it the state because they control even more jails and prisons? Who are our targets? Once you've identified your targets, you move backward from that and you say, what will affect our targets? Because the truth of the matter is when you ask that question and you ask it enough, you'll get a long list, right? Donations impact some of those folks because they're policymakers and they got to run for office. Protests will affect some of those folks. Um, ex you know, exposure, right? But for lack of a better term, public embarrassment about you said this, but you voted this way. Let's make sure everybody knows about the voting record. Let's make sure everybody knows about the budget that you voted yes for, right? Sometimes the amount of money to police that it gives to, to mental health and houselessness. What are the, how are the targets going to be impacted in the way that you want to be impacted? What will move them, right? And how, and now how do we go and do the things that will move them? That is actually where the protest comes in. Notice that's the fourth or fifth step. It's not the first one. Right? right? Because diligent, disciplined protest says, I come with a plan and I know that dramatizing the issue, which protest does, and mounting the pressure, which protest can do, um, is but one act of a much longer play. And right. I need to be prepared to run that play to the very end, right? And to know that it is a longitudinal work that you don't protest on one day and expect everything to be, you know, done. It's been so fascinating how many people have written articles and said Michael Brown was killed in 2014. The a Ferguson uprising launched that year. George Floyd was killed in 2020. Breonna Taylor was killed in 2020. Now it's 2023. How much has changed? And it's not the wrong question, but often people are not framing that question in good faith. They're 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 framing it in such a way this that where they're actually asking or telling you not much has changed in those years, right? Well, I'm sorry if we were brought over here in 1619, and it's 2020, 2020, and you're just now talking about police violence in your comfortable spaces, in your privileged spaces, in the living rooms of white people. How in the world did you expect me to end racial violence and racial injustice in America in six, in three years, in 10 years? Not only is that an impossible task, it's impossible without the people who are benefiting most from the system contributing to its dismantling daily. And how many people want to dismantle the thing that benefits them? Mm. There are not many people who are interested in that work. So we've spent the better part of these last 10 years, A, trying to just illustrate the problem, that it's right. not random people being killed by the police and that this narrative that they want to give you that everybody had a gun or a knife or some of these are justifiable losses or kills. Well, now we have to explain to you that none of us should be paying into a system that is justified to kill us, right? Right. And now I have to convince you that actually it's your problem too, because not only do the police also kill white people, you should not be invested in that if you want to be invested in democracy. 
And now I have to spend all this time convincing you to dismantle something that benefits you. And you think that you can just learn that by reading the books that somebody on Instagram told you to read and posting a black square. And now you've moved back on to business as usual and you don't even care anymore. You're firing the, the, the DEI chiefs that you hired. You're dismantling the DEI teams that you created. You all are acting like racism has been solved or at the very least, the trend doesn't matter to you anymore. So here we are in position and you all aren't even ready to commit this as daily practice. And when I say you all, I very specifically mean white people. And you expect us to, you expect us, the survivors of racial injustice and violence, at least so far, right? We're so far breathing. Not all of us can say the same. You want the survivors and the victims of it to have solved it in nine years since 2014? Please make it make sense. You can't. Um, and so when we understand, those of us who want to stand on the right side of history, that it is a longitudinal practice, that it is a constant practice of recruitment, of trying to build the biggest choir for justice that you can and then coach them to all sing on the same note at the same time in the same way, that that is lifelong work. And then if you are only in it episodically, I'm not even going to blame you because you got a life to live, you got children to feed, you got a job to go to. But if you're invested in it episodically, at the very least, invest in the people who are able to do it longitudinally. Show up when they ask you to, even if it's once a year. You know, one of the things I, I really love about what you said, Brittany, is this idea that you don't want to just do something every so often. And I love that because a part of the six steps of nonviolence is information gathering, That's right. education, and then personal commitment. So That's even right. for you, as you're just even talking about like, if you want to solve the issue, you got to know where you're going. Like you got to yeah. know what the end goal is. So who are you actually targeting? What organization, yeah. what particular policies, what branch of government yeah. do you need to identify with? So even you talking about before you get to the protest, hello, what's yeah. our end goal? Yep. Yeah. Who do we need to talk to? Who have yeah. we talked to already? But so on the other <laughs> side of this, if we get this protest started off, we want to make sure that we have clear demands and there's yep. a clear expectation of what the end result is going to be. So I That's love right. how concise you put that because I think that makes it so much easier. But on top yeah. of that, Brittany, it makes the protesting that much more realistic. That's because right. now if I can attribute my effort and my work That's to right. solving a problem, then that means I'm going into this with a commitment in mind and that That's I'm right. not stopping until the problem is rectified. So first off, that was spectacular. I love that. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Sure. So I'm going to combine these last two, you know, for the sake of our time, but again, it's sure. a chance to, to go off because, you know, you, trust me, you, you can do this for <laughs> me. Like, I'm a double know. PK and I'm like, if somebody don't shut me up, I can keep going all day. <laughs> nah, we <laughs> right. love it. We love it. You know, we love it. So when you think about for yourself, the first part is, what what has Dr. King's legacy and Mrs. Coretta Scott King's legacy, one, what has that done for you? And what has that meant for mm. you? That's the first part. Mm. And then the second part of that question is, what commitment did you derive out of what they taught you? So as you've yeah. learned about them, how has that inspired you as you move forward? And what about what they did and what they've done and the legacy they built how has that helped to change you from the inside out? That way you can create change in the world. I love those two questions and I'm so grateful for them. You know, I've learned so much from both of their example. And I, I love the way that um, Reverend Dr. Bernice talks about this and the way the King Center is so committed to making sure that when we think of the King legacy, that we acknowledge that it was both Dr. King and Coretta Scott King that built it. And in particular, Coretta Scott King that make sure that made sure we still have access to it, right? Um, and I learned so many things from them. I learned the power of community and family units, right? That there is no Dr. King without Coretta and there's no Coretta Scott without Dr. King in the ways that we have come to know them um, uh, as a world. Right. Not that they didn't exist before being married, but that they treated that unit, that family unit together with their children um, as as the foundation for the work. 
right? The power of community to say that if injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, then when I arrive at the place where injustice exists, I don't get to just arrive on my high horse with an agenda for other people on how to do the work. I have to be in community with the folks that have been on the ground, that have been working through this, that have been uh, trying to, to figure this out. And in my own practice, a lot of what I end up doing, frankly, especially these days, especially with the advent of COVID and so many more things being virtual and those virtual platforms being so much more important for me, um, is that I'm, I'm not even showing up physically because there are people there doing the work and my ego doesn't need me to, need to lead me down there to be in front. Sometimes what I'm doing is amplifying the work you're doing. Sometimes what I'm doing is making sure people know about your march, that people know how to donate to you. Sometimes what I'm doing is actually I'm on late night calls with the local organizers sharing whatever experience I have. Sometimes, you know, I'm actually totally behind the scenes and I'm paying for, uh, you know, a web address and a website and designing the website for people to take action myself, um, not for any kind of fame or glory. Um, uh, but for the function of the movement and the the recognition that all of us have a role to play. I think that's one of the things that I learned from how they moved throughout the country and the world, both apart from each other and together, um, and did so in respectful community with others who they knew also had powerful contributions to make. Um, I learned from them the power of the power of passing it on, right? The power of making sure that as we always say, like we don't lose the recipes, right? That like, you gotta write the book, you gotta archive the speeches, you gotta, you know, emblazon the beloved, you know, the six steps of the beloved community on the side of the wall so that the people never forget. And so that they've got a lesson plan to work from, that they got a recipe to, to cook from, right? Um, and I think that so often we, especially with the, short shelf life of thoughts on social media, public thoughts on social media, we think, well, if I tweet it, that's fine. You know, interestingly, I've actually been off of Twitter and Instagram for a couple of days now, um, in part because they were they were literally detrimental to my health. Like my therapist yeah. and my doc, my PCP were like, you got to like stop getting so many inputs. It is sensory overload for you. It's causing you migraines. It's making your stomach hurt. That's not going to work. But also... What it helped me do is, is focus on the permanent things, right? And it's ironic in a way to be off of those platforms in a time when I'm very sure there are people in my DM saying, why didn't you say anything about this? Why didn't you say anything about that? It's not that I don't have an opinion. Sometimes I want to make sure that my opinion is educated and informed, not just by the books, not just by a Western media that I know is biased, but also by people who are living these experiences. And it is okay for everybody not to have a hot take about everything, right? It's okay for us to stay in our lane. It's actually quite healthy. Um, but also that in that time, I'm actually able to be in community with the people that I know, right? To reach out to people who I know who are trying to process the violence that the world has seen um, from many different angles, to reach out to my my actual Jewish friends in my phone, to reach out to my actual Palestinian friends in my phone, to reach out to my actual friends in Atlanta and New York in my like and get on FaceTime and talk it through. You know what I mean? Or just be like, I'm here for you if you ever need a container to hold what you're working through. Right. Yeah. That kind of community cannot be replaced. Um, right. And it can't be sped through because we're always trying to speed toward a hot take, right? Um, and our learning can't be sped through because we feel like I got to say something and I got to say something now because the pressure is too too heavy. I learned from them how to resist the pressure of the world and be rooted in a set of values and principles that are developed in community with people and that are influenced by elders who have passed you wisdom and young people who have passed you wisdom to say, actually, I hear all of this, but I need to talk to God. I need to talk to my siblings in this work and I need to plant my feet on solid ground before I move forward. Right. Um, and, and, and in order to make sure that I move forward in a way that is accountable, that is true to my values, that has integrity and that is appropriate to the role I should play, because I'm actually not a scholar on this or I'm not a leader on that. And I did not write the definitive book on that. So what is the role I should play? I also 
am going to be honest in saying that, especially from the time that he was alive, when we really read into Dr. King and Coretta Scott King's lives during kind of the heat of the movement, right? They are not actually necessarily living a life where they fully get to live that life. They're not able to take the family vacations. They're not living in um, a, a lot of creature comforts, right? Because they've chosen to give so much of what they have away. They're not, you know, self-care was not the talk back then, right? In the, in the era or in their home. And I want to make sure that current and future generations of activists and organizers and protesters and writers and artists and public thinkers who are committed to using whatever their gifts are for justice, I want to make sure that this is work that is sustainable for all of us. Because so many of our elders who did this work their whole lives died in abject poverty. People not having being able to afford gravestones on their burial plots, right? And there's a responsibility that we have to each other to remind each other that especially as Black folks, abundance is our birthright. That like, that's one of those inalienable rights that people don't get to take from us. Our ancestors were here and in their labor, in their toil, in their survival, in their insurance that our bloodline survived instead of just being discarded when the labor was done. They reminded everybody that abundance is our birthright. And so how dare we not live in it when we finally are granted the opportunity to because they work so hard to make that happen? How dare we not live in it when we know what Audre Lorde said that caring for myself is not self-indulgent, it is self-preservation and that is an act of political warfare, right? How dare we not live in it when we know that the will of our oppressors and our opposition is not just to kill us, but to kill our, our ability to resist. And so if we are not able to figure out in community with one another how we do good and be well, then we not not only does the work not stand a chance, we're not honoring the space that the ancestors and that God carved out for us, right? That that we owe ourselves and one another. I, I will be honest in saying I'm in the midst of trying to actually practice that right now because I'm 38 years old and at least for the last 10 years, but honestly for far more, because I've been doing this work since I was in elementary school, there's not been a lot of times where I've been able to properly extract my personhood from my purpose work. And when you see yourself as one and the same with your labor, you can easily get confused and burnt out. And when you're burnt out, you're not giving your best to anybody, including the work that you've committed to, including the purpose that you're trying to, to live up to. So I'm also thinking about the ways in which they probably did not get the rest that they needed and deserved. They probably did not get the, the restoration that they needed and deserved. They probably did not get to frolic and bask in the sun like Black people should be able to do every day because that too is an affront to white supremacy, right? Um, so I, I, I also learned from them and so many of our elders that um, our pleasure, our our care for ourselves and one another should never be in the in the in to paraphrase um, Sonia Renee Taylor should not be an apology ever, not even to other people doing this work who think we should be exhausting ourselves more than they are, who think we should be more visible and more present in a certain moment because they are and they think we should be too. Um, so yeah, so many lessons. And I think what is there for us to collectively take is A, again, to do good and be well, because that is the only way that we can actually keep this work going, but also to be grounded and rooted in a set of values, in integrity, and in a vision for the world that is not exclusive to you and your block, and that is not, um, and that is not uh, uh, exclusive to um, 
to to repeating the same patterns that we've already endured and just putting a different name and face on them, right? To be disciplined, to be focused, to be committed, and to operate in integrity and community. And when we do that, whether we're in the streets, in the policy building, or anywhere in between, not only can we win, but we will win. You know what I love about that synopsis and, and the way you're able to surmise your own experience as opposed, and on top of what they experience, I think being rooted in something that is real and authentic to yourself, and whether that is in your faith and your community and your family. That's right. You know, uh, again, you know, principle six of nonviolence is that the universe is on the side of justice. God That's is right. a God of justice. And so right. I think having a a posture, an emotional, spiritual, physical posture that believes mm, that the work yeah. will be accomplished and that you are a vessel for that work to be accomplished is so important. But mm -hmm. on the other side of this, also, I think for yourself, and I'm encouraging Brittany, like this is, you know, <laughs> take off the interview hat on. I'm encouraging Brittany, making sure you're investing in your godhood and the fact that yeah. God has made you yeah. to be a person with experiences and that. family and, and love. Like, you know, just that. the work is a part of what we do, but you know what's funny? We were we were human before we were put under the trials and fires. Now, come of on now. Talk you know, about you were already it. a person. You were made right. to exist and to have a life. And so right. while we get lost in the fact that it's true, the purpose is that I have to help bring restoration and freedom mm -hmm. for others. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that, I'm supposed to be experiencing restoration and freedom for myself. That's right. So finding the way to exist in those realities. And in a way, I think, Brittany, one of the great things about this <laughs> is for millennials and Gen Z, like, what does that mean for me? Like, how do yeah. I do that for myself? Because I want to make sure I'm helping other people to realize that there's a way to be committed to the work as opposed, and also be able to be committed to myself, That's right. my own wellness. So. Well, first off, 1,000%, this was uh, an amazing conversation, an amazing interview. Your insight was invaluable. Thank and, you. Uh, your questions were so amazing. You. Thank you so much. I, I truly enjoyed it. It helped me work out some things in my own brain. I hope it's beneficial to the people who are listening and that they get something from it. That's always my prayer. Um, and listen, I'm not the authority on everything. There are so many people that you've had on the podcast. There are scholars and writers and researchers and organizers that um, we should all be learning from. And if you hear something that I said that's in contradiction to something somebody else said, then like, you know, take the meat and leave the scraps. Take take what you need to do the work that your purpose to do and to live the life that you are gifted most fully. Well, you all, this is the Rethink Podcast. These are the kind of conversations we have. Great, great guests like Brittany who are educated, who are inspiring, who have done the work and who believe in the mission of the work. So uh, continue to be a part of this journey with us here at the King Center, again, led by Dr. Bernice A. King, CEO of the King Center. We are here to make sure that you have the tools you need to believe and live a way of nonviolence in your own life to build a beloved community right where you are. That way you may be the change that you hope to see in the world. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe this episode. Let your friends and family know where you like to get all your information around the world and around nonviolence right here with the Rethink Podcast. Y'all, this is your host, Cameron Friend, and I can't wait to see y'all soon.